welcome everybody to our monthly knowledge at noon. This is just a reminder that as you roll in to mute yourselves and to turn off your camera, so that way we can ensure a smooth streaming experience for all. Knowledge at Noon is our free monthly speaker series featuring artists, historians, and agricultural professionals that explore themes central to Yellow Arts and Yellow County Historical Collection exhibits at our Gibson House and property. Um, before we get started, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Drusella Miranda. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the interim art education manager at Yellow Arts. And um, I want to let you all know that our partner for this event is the Yellow County Library. Um, so make sure you follow them on social media as well as us to keep up with any new events that we may have. Um, and as you all know, May is approaching very fast. I don't know about you all, but 2021 is like happening so quickly. It's almost scary, um, but we are a nonprofit here at Yellow Arts. And if you enjoy our free programming, such as Knowledge at Noon, you can support our programming by becoming a member at www yellowarts.org slash give or donate to Yellow Arts at the upcoming Big Day of Giving on May 6th this year. Our info will be shown at the very end. So in case you didn't catch that, don't worry, there's another chance to follow up and see what you can do to donate and support us. Um, but without further ado, I am going to pass the mic over to my partner for today, um, who is the curator um, for the um, Yolo County Historical Collection. And I will let you introduce yourself. All right, hello, hello all. My name is Yulia Bodanu um, and I am the curator of the Yolo County Historical Collection. And today we are very lucky to have Dr. Bob LaPierre as our speaker for Knowledge at Noon. And Dr. Bob is the curator of the Sacramento Valley Medical Society Museum of Medical History um, in Sacramento and is an active voice within the Sacramento history um, community. I have visited <laughs> Dr. Bob's museum and it is um, full of amazing um, medical items and um, so much local history, it's, um, it's crazy. Um, so we're lucky to have Dr. Bob with us today to illuminate um, us on medical practices and what they looked like during the gold rush um, and how these practices impacted Sacramento and Yolo counties. Um, in partnership, um, we have our exhibit, Healing Histories, that is open at the Gibson House, that is open um, through December, so plenty of time um, to see it. Um, and currently, the Gibson House is open on Thursdays from 2.30 to uh, 5 p.m. Um, so hopefully, uh, Dr. Bob's presentation will shed some light on um, medical practices um, from the gold rush to today. And also, please visit the Gibson House um, to see the exhibit Healing Histories. So I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Bob. Okay, I will go to sharing my screen here. Okay, I'm going to talk about gold rush era medicine today. And uh, really happy that Yolo County invited us because her museum is part of the Tri-County Medical Society of Sacramento, El Dorado, and Yolo County. Now, the beginning uh, of Gold Rush Medicine begins with the Gold Rush in January 24th, 1848. James Marshall saw something shiny in Sutter Creek near Coloma, discovered gold while overseeing construction of a sawmill on the American River. So began the influx of thousands of gold seekers to a new and rugged frontier with no infrastructure to cope with such a crowd, no public health measures, a region described by a first comer as one of the most healthful territories on the continent with a climate unrivaled in purity and equability, nor is sickness that scourge of humanity here to harass and hinder us in our pursuits. But with no public health measures and minimal hygiene, within a few short months, the gold rush immigration produced a collecting point of health tragedy, not to be equal to any other place in the world. Doctors did arrive with the gold rush, many in the hopes to find gold themselves, but more likely to find disease and suffering and be stimulated and challenged to resume their dedication to the practice of medicine and initiate public health measures. Now, the first medical society in California, 1850, the Medical Surgical, and that's the British spelling for surgical, Medical Surgical Association, 
followed five years later by the Sacramento Medical Society, followed a year later by the California State Medical Society, which was a precursor of our current California Medical Association and was the beginning of California's organized medicine and health care. And then that was succeeded in 1858 by the County Pathological Society. <clears throat> Well, by 1863, the Sacramento Medical Chir Surgical Association, the Sacramento Medical Society and the Sacramento County Pathologic Society had all disappeared. But by six, 1868, the physicians had gained a lot of knowledge and organization. Many of those involved in the former organization formed the Sacramento Society for Medical Improvement which later became the Sacramento El Dorado Medical Society, and now is a Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society, uh, in, including, as I mentioned, three counties, Sacramento, El Dorado, and Yolo. Two years ago, three years ago, actually, was the 150th anniversary of our society, and it's been in continuous operation since 1868, and is the oldest county medical society in California based in continuous years of existence. Now the 19th century was an era of treating the patient, which was the only option because the cause of most disorders was not understood and therefore one could not treat the disease as is now done. Therefore, the benefit of the physician in many diseases was questionable. As this was an era before immunizations, childhood diseases were a tragedy and numerous children never made it past the age of two or three. Now, being sick in medical treatment in the 1800s, this letter really nicely summarizes what that was like. And this is a letter that was presented to me by one of my patients. And we have the original letter in the museum. Uh, it was written from one of her relatives to another relative in about 1820. And it reads, on the 6th of September, I was seriously attacked with a bilious fever, <clears throat> also threatened with a dropsy. My physician thought it impossible for me to bear a run of the fever. He commenced breaking it on Sunday by bleeding and puking, which was continued on Monday. I was partially deranged on Sunday, which was followed by a state of mental madness caused by excruciating pain about the crown of my head, of the most agonizing torture that experience could conceive <clears throat> or tongue describe. I had my head shaved and blistered, one also upon my neck, upon my back, upon my bowels, one upon each arm, one upon each leg, eight in number, all sore at a time, very large and inflamed. Yet the chief evidence I have of the existence is the scars upon my body. A partial derangement succeeded madness. Three months are lost to me, Time appears like an almost forgotten dream. I must turn from this subject, the recollection, uh, <coughs> recollection of it chills my blood. I view this affliction as a punishment for an abuse of reason. My nerves are still irritable. My health is tolerably good. Now we'll take a look at the gold rush. 6%, that was the overall mortality of those heading west, and those that survived often found death was not far behind them. <clears throat> Most common medical problems included gastrointestinal illnesses, from chronic complaints to diarrhea, dysentery, and diseases such as cholera and typhoid. And there are lots of medicines around. Uh, to try to remedy these conditions, of course, none of them really worked. There was Munyon's cholera cure, the Woodbridge treatment of typhoid fever, Moore's pills for malarial diseases, and Dr. Shoup's diphtheria remedy. Water, water everywhere, and not a drink we would enjoy drinking. No wonder gastrointestinal disorders were so common back then. 
one quote from a journal. Once we came to a puddle where rainwater had been standing till green on top and so muddy that if there had been a hog about, I should have set down as one of their wallowing places. Yet this stuff, which would have been rejected very suddenly by my stomach and home, I drank with considerable relish by shutting my eyes and holding my breath. This is what is called seeing one of the elephant tracks. While well, treading the elephant's tail, going to see the elephant were all terms meaning one had gained experience by undergoing hardship, which of course was very true during the gold rush. <clears throat> Another quote, and I think my favorite, our drinking water is living. That is, it is composed of one third green fine moss, one third polywogs and one third mosquito embryos and we strain these through our teeth. Another major problem occurred in those who did not bring citrus or utilize fresh vegetation, and that was scurvy or vitamin C deficiency. It also claimed numerous lives. Another graphic description from a journal reads, I was much surprised today with indications of the scurvy, pain in the ankles and legs, sores breaking out in my hands, and bleeding of my gums when polishing my teeth. God grant it may not be, for I've suffered enough already, I think. And there's an image from an 1800 medical text of scurvy. <clears throat> Another quote from a diary, the amount of suffering in the latter part of the route was almost incalculable. I saw men sitting or lying by the roadside sick with fevers, or crippled by scurvy, begging of the passerby to lend them some assistance, but no one could do it. Consequently, they were left to a slow, lingering death in the wilderness. <clears throat> and again, some images of scurvy. Now, general anesthesia using ether was not available till 1846, and and antisepsis did not really evolve till 1865. Uh, and both these advances took many years before they were generally accepted. So you can just imagine uh, what surgery was like during the gold rush. The need for amputation was frequent, a procedure going back centuries. If a fracture penetrated the skin, what we call a compound fracture, the mortality rate was about 100% due to infection before the days of antibiotics, whereas the mortality rate of amputation was 50%. So one out of two patients was saved by amputation. And here is a typical amputation kit. Uh, this is a typical Civil War one in a beautiful wooden case. It contains a variety of things, including a tree fine, which would be used to bore a hole in the skull to release blood from an injury that was pressing in the brain, uh, a haze bone saw, which was a saw used for the skull, and of course underneath were all the knives and the, uh, the saws that were used. Now here's an image of someone at that time doing an amputation. Uh, he would hold the blood vessel up with the tenaculum well, he tied it off. <clears throat> and all these immigrants were coming to a land described as one of the most healthful territories on the continent with a climate unrivaled in purity and equability, nor sickness at scourge of humanity here to harass and hinder us <coughs> in our pursuits. However, as the population of Sacramento acutely jumped from 2,000 to 10,000, and a quarter of a million people poured into California, the immigrants exceeded the facilities. Sanitation was a luxury, and the 49ers lived primarily in tent cities, squalid cabins, and shacks where human sewage polluted the streams. Few who worked in the mines ever carried home their prior state of good health, and then they got worse. The floods of January 1850 brought typhoid, encephalitis, diarrhea, malnutrition, and other disorders. All these diseases were complicated 
by the arrival later that year of cholera. The physicians, it was said, did noble work. No danger appalled them. Night and day they responded to the call of distress, scarcely pausing to snatch a few hours of needed sleep and rest. Now we'll take a closer look into one of the three perils of the 1800s. Sacramento was repeatedly decimated by floods, fire, and disease, but it always rebounded. We'll now look at the reasons behind many of the 19th century deaths and many of what were considered mass burials. <coughs> A disease not known in California today, but still not uncommon in other parts of the world. Let's take ourselves back to the gold rush, about 170 years, population of Sacramento about 8,000, and there are about 50 doctors in the recently formed Medical Surgical Association. According to the New York Journal of Medicine, over the prior six months, 90,000 people arrived in California, 30,000 of these by sea, which was a voyage of up to 17,000 miles. And I do not think I could uh, take that long a voyage today, even in the uh, current cruise ship. The other 60,000 crossed arid plains and rugged mountains. It was said death was not a stranger. It was estimated that one fifth found graves within the first six months after arrival. And if you add that to the 6% that died uh, on the crossing, you're looking about um, one out of four people were dead within six months of arriving for the gold rush. Cholera was rampant on the Eastern seaboard during 1849, 1850 and traveled through New Orleans and up the Mississippi Valley. This is an image of the new world that brought good and bad news to California. And this was in October 18th, 1850. The good news was the news of California statehood. Well, at that time, there was no sanitation, no clean drinking water in Sacramento, mounds of garbage, human and animal waste, dead animals, and all manner of trash accumulated behind Sacramento's tent dwellings, boarding houses, gaming parlors, stores, and food establishments. The stage was set for an epidemic, and all it would take was one victim to arrive and set it off. And there was the victim. <clears throat> dying in the levee after disembarking from the new world. He sparked an epidemic that caused panic, total panic in Sacramento, and this was cholera. Now, let's take a look at a medical textbook description, a textbook actually from the mid 1800s to understand the terror that cholera produced. <coughs> cholera generally commences with a vertigo, headache, and singing in the ears, a sensation of flatulence in the stomach or gripping pains and a feeling of weight and oppression in the region of the heart. We find the lips, nails, and sometimes the whole skin of a blue color. The frame loses its power of generating heat. The pulse and pulsation of the heart are almost unfelt. The attack of the disease in extreme cases is so sudden that from a state of apparent good health or with a feeling only of trifling ailment, an individual sustains as rapid a loss of bodily power as if he were suddenly struck down or placed under the immediate effects of some poison. The countenance assuming a death-like appearance, the skin becoming cold and giving the sensation of coldness and moisture perceived in touching a frog and to others, the coldness of the skin of a person already dead. The eyes are sunk in their sockets, the tongue is cold, and either clean or covered with a slight white fur. You can see by this description, typical of medical text of the time, this was indeed a disease to be feared. During the epidemic, thousands and an estimated four-fifths of the population of Sacramento <coughs> left the city, carrying the disease into the foothills, but also abandoning those afflicted, including relatives, to die alone. A Sacramento reporter for Alta, a newspaper of the time, November 4th, 1850, wrote, the city presents an aspect which is truly terrible. Three of the largest gambling halls are closed. 
and you knew when the gambling halls closed in River City, there was a major problem. The streets were deserted and frequently only by the hearse. Nearly all business was at a standstill. There seems to be a deep sense of expectancy mingled with fear pervading all classes. There's an expression of anxiety in every eye and all sense of pecuniary loss is merged in a greater apprehension of personal danger. Many deaths are concealed and many not reported. But at the worst, more than 40 deaths per 24 hours occurred, a mortality rate of about 1% of the population daily. Within 18 days, about 1,000 died, an estimated 15% of Sacramento's population. The fatality rate of approximately 50%, a typical statistic for the time, and often death occurred within 24 hours of onset. It's estimated that up to 5,000 people may have died in Northern California from the single, single epidemic as people migrated north. The physicians all remained caring for their patients and they also died. <clears throat> Dr. Morris wrote, the rapid spreading of the epidemic gave to the physicians no rest day or night. They were failing like the foremost soldiers of a desperate charge and ere this cholera season had subsided, 17 of their number were deposited in Sand Hill Cemetery of our city. An inroad of death from which a fraction of two in three escaped with life and not one in three from disease. And yet not one educated physician turned his back upon the city and its distress and threatened destruction. <clears throat> Dr. Thomas Logan, a pioneer physician who served during the epidemic stated, no monument of marble records their heroic deeds, but their memories shall remain in the pages of the history of medicine of California, an imperishable legacy to the profession they have ennobled and adorned. Here's an image, Dr. Logan was also an artist. This is an image that he did in 1855 for the equivalent of what was the state fair at that time. And Dr. Logan also wrote the first medical history of California in 1868. These are the 17 physicians out of the 50 estimated to be in the city at the time that died from cholera while remaining behind to take care of their patients. And they all lie in an unknown graves in the Sacramento City Cemetery, except for one that is in the Pioneer Grove. And that's Dr. Pliny Green, whose image you see to the right. Cholera was ascribed to various causes, including effluvial emanations or miasma. And this is a little bit about miasma, which was an unpleasant or unhealthy smell or vapor often coming from the swamplands. And this shows an image of miasma running right down along the whole Sacramento Valley. Others blamed unwholesome food, damp weather, wet feet or suppression of perspiration. And so others blame something that apparently was commonly done during the gold rush and that was eating indigestible foods and drinking cheap champagne. And of course, treatment was non-existence. A city board of health was formed 12 years later in response to a smallpox epidemic. It established an effective quarantine, including a pest house to house the poor and the homeless with great benefit. Even though not formed until 1862, the board had this distinction of being the second such organization in the United States. It's often said that we learn by history and history may keep us from repeating mistakes. Well, let's look at a comment on the cholera epidemic again by Dr. John Morris. And here's a picture of Dr. Morris in his younger days. In six days from the time of its inception, it was making such progress that regular burials were but slightly attended to and nursing and attention were not infrequently overlooked. Money could scarcely buy the offices of human kindness and affections were so neutralized 
by the conflicting element of selfishness that but little could be done to arrest the course of the disease. Malaria was also a prevalent disease throughout the summer of 1849, as were scurvy, diarrhea, dysentery, typhoid, rheumatism, erysipelas, pneumonia, mental diseases, and more. Uh, and they all came with immigration. As you recall, the prior description of the healthful environment of Sacramento, appreciate that within a few short months, the gold rush immigration produced a collecting point of health tragedy not to be equal in any other place in the world. Well, beyond epidemics in the 1800s were marked by marvelous medicine dedicated to hardworking, civilly, civically oriented men. <clears throat> Here's a list of some that were <coughs> present and you can see <coughs> uh, the dates to the right. Uh, so most of these were present during the gold rush. Well, we have Dr. Harkness and this image to the right is a school in Sacramento named after him. Dr. Nixon was a very prominent railroad physician. Here a rate of charges at that time for medical care. And of course, we had many other prominent physicians such as Dr. Nichols, Dr. Simmons, and of course, again, Dr. John Morris. Dr. Morris wrote the first history of Sacramento <coughs> in 1853, <coughs> and it's a fascinating read. And this history is a colorful excerpt describing the medical condition of a patient rescued from a hospital in what now is old Sacramento is invading floodwaters moved into Sacramento. This is a picture of the reprint of the first city of Sacramento City that's been reprinted by the Book Collectors Club and is available. We do have copies at the Medical Museum or if people are interested in contacting me, we'll make sure that you can get a copy of it. Uh, it, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal read. Now, going back to Dr. Morse, here's one of his quotes. From a miserable canvas building in K Street between second and third called a hospital, the most dreadful representatives of a worse <coughs> than heartless neglect were rescued from the invading waters and thrust in the above frame hospital in the opposite corner. Three were brought at one boatload, rolled up in the blankets in which they had been lying. No one could tell how long, but certainly in a condition too horrible to be seen and too awful to meet a faithful description. <clears throat> well, Dr. Morris tried to provide a faithful description. <clears throat> I said one of them whose blanket enveloped the entire body and head seemed to be rapidly dying and consequently he was the first to get the attention of the physicians and nurses. An attempt was made to unroll the blanket, but it was found to be so adherent to many parts of the body as to make it difficult of removal. <clears throat> so difficult that the effort was delayed after the face was relieved for the deplorable victim to revive if possible or if not, the death might free him from his sense of situation. Fortunately for him, death was a speedy alternative. His troubles were ended, a finely developed form, a face in which lingered the indices of cultivated intellect, a heart that once beat with manly pride, were enwrapped in a death so dreadful as to beg our description and so appalling as to excite an almost eternal impression of nausea and disgust in the minds of those who beheld it. The blanket was with difficulty detached and when drawn off presented a shirtless body partially devoured by an immense bed of maggots occupying nearly as much space as the emaciated carcass itself. And when one adds to this loathsome mass, these crawling elements of disgust, the accumulated excretions which were alike confined by the agglutinated folds of the blanket, a head of hair almost clogged up with vermin, then can a just conception be formed of what was suffered during the sickness of the fall and winter of 1849. 
Well, I think Dr. Morris really did a good job portraying what life and death was like back then. <clears throat> so what about maggots? They are still used today. Maggots, of course, clean wounds beautifully. They clean wounds almost better than anything we have in modern medicine. And because of that, they are available from a company in the southwestern United, southeastern United States <coughs> for use in a hospital for treating wounds. And of course, in the gold rush, maggots were everywhere. They're fly eggs. So anyone who had an open wound with all the flies around, there was a chance that they developed maggots. However, today that is not commonly the case. And therefore, for $190, a physician can prescribe a bottle of maggots that will be applied in the hospital to the wound. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to explore medicine after the gold rush. It did improve to some extent. Now the doctors, and this goes back to the doctors during the gold rush, the allopath, which was the equivalent of our MD today, learned medicine both through medical schools and three preceptorships, which was <coughs> working with the physician for several years until they felt they had learned enough to open their own practice. One of the reasons for the formation of our medical society was to protect the public from irregular physicians. Now types of doctors in the 1800s, again, were the, was the allopath, the regular physician like your MD today, and the Chinese doctors are herbalists. Now there are also the irregulars, the impositors, which really weren't an irregular physician. They were almost a separate group, but there were people like uh, hospital maintenance men from the Southeast that thought they learned enough about medicine, working as the maintenance man in a hospital to open a, uh, a uh, doctor's office in Sacramento during the gold rush. We had the eclectic physicians who took a little bit of all the other disciplines of medicine, the homeopathic physician, and homeopaths of course are not uncommon today, and they thought that if you administer a minute amount of an agent that produced the same symptoms in the patient as a disease did, you could cure the patient. Thomsonians, were believers in herbal medicine. And of course, hydropaths believed in water, both internally and externally. <clears throat> now we had a hydropath in early Sacramento and her office was pretty much where <coughs> the Sacramento History Museum is. Interesting enough, her name was Lavina Waterhouse. Good name for a hydropathic physician. Born in New York, uh, arrived in California about 1853 and ran the Sacramento Water Cure. <clears throat> the Irregulars often had a large following because their use of cupping, bleeding, puking, and purging was minimal. Now the doctor is a painting, 1891 painting, uh, and Luke, had the desire to put on record the status of a doctor in his time. And it depicts a Victorian doctor observing the critical stage in a child's in the illness, uh, likely based upon his own experience of the death of his one-year-old son on Christmas morning. And I think it gives you a real feeling, a real feeling for the mood. Oops. Sorry about that. For the mood of uh, what life was like and what medicine was like and what illness was like in the 1800s. <clears throat> of course, anatomy images were important. People could not always dissect a cadaver to learn medicine. Uh, Vesalius was a Flemish anatomist and physician, author of one of the most influential books in human anatomy, 
and often referred to as a founder of modern human anatomy. And the image to the left is one of his from the 1500s. The images to the right were engraved a hundred years later by Von Avera. And you can see uh, he probably didn't wanna be accused of plagiarism. So he reversed the images uh, 180 degrees, uh, but he, he pretty much reproduced by re-engraving in wood Vesalius's images. And the two pictures to the right we have actually in our medical museum. There are a number of anatomy books of the time and the artists were very impressive uh, exhibiting the anatomy at that time. MacLeese was one of the common books, 1851, the image to the right. And again, we have these books in our museum. We mentioned Chinese medicine with a number of Chinese in the mid 1800s building the railroad and the levees. It was common and effective. And it was a Chinese doctor and herbalist actually that saved Governor Stanford's wife when she suffered a severe lung condition. <coughs> no doctor available? Well, you went to self-treatment. This is one of uh, many, many guides. This is from 1925, uh, but it represented the publications going back to the 1800s. During the gold rush, a number of similar books were printed telling people how to survive the trek to the West and telling them how to take care of their family for various illnesses. Here are a couple of the books in our library. Uh, love the inscription and the one, you can do nothing to bring the dead to life, but you can do much to save the living from death. And that's from the Library of Health. When available, of course, the benefit of physicians was often questionable because disease processes were frequently not understood. So sometimes a family could produce results as good as a physician would at that time. Here's an image of another book from 1847, Diseases of Woman. <clears throat> now, of course, patent medicines were very common. Uh, in the 1800s and even today. And this Collier's article from 1905 was called Death's Laboratory. And it said, pad medicines are poisoning people throughout America today. Babies who cry are fed laudanum under the name of syrup. And we have a bottle of that in the museum uh, with instructions for teeth and particularly for infants. Now, in June 1906, President Roosevelt signed into law the Food and Drug Act, also known as the Wiley Act, and the name was changed to the Food and Drug Administration three years later. And this shows just a sample of the different medications, patent medications of the time. We have Wendell's Ambition Pills, Mac Man Tablets, Flatulence, which contained nuts vomica, which obtained, is obtained from the seed of the strychnine tree, and a sedative with uh, cannabis in it, of course, and a variety of other patent medicines, mainly from the turn of the century, early 1900s. <clears throat> Now, this I included just because I love the name of it, per notice for making a flesh-reducing remedy. A couple of other pad medicines of time. And while I get a sip of water, I'll let you read some of the text in that. I love the Captain John orderlies for constipation, biliousness, and dyspepsia. <clears throat> constipation was really a, an important thing to people in the early 1900s, probably the late 1800s. Uh, and Bernard McFadden, who some of you might have heard about, he was a bodybuilding and nutritional and health fan and wrote a book totally in constipation. Well, of course, quackery was common. 
This is one quackery item we have in our museum in Davis and Kidder's electric machine. <coughs> you put a finger in each of the two metal tubes, have someone crank up the crank and produce a little electrical stimulation. Now I'll let you guess for a minute what these are. I, they're obvious to a lot of people from the 1890s to the 1940s. They were rectal dilators, but they were not primarily for rectal problems or piles. They were recommended for headache, neuralgia, rheumatism, insomnia, asthma, indigestion, uh, and all diseases caused by sluggish circulation. Glad we're using modern medicine today, right? How about if you had a toothache? <clears throat> well, if you were lucky and you're in Sacramento and during the gold rush, Dr. Henry Pearson, a dentist, was here in 1849. However, if you weren't lucky enough to have a dentist, you might visit the local blacksmith. And up until 1860s, dentistry was largely unregulated and blacksmiths as dentists dates back to the 17th century. Now we'll look a little at diseases and disorders. Diseases during the gold rush and still around today, of course, but not necessarily in the United States, were yellow fever, malaria, typhoid, typhus, and cholera, and many more, including childhood diseases. Yellow fever was not endemic in Sacramento, uh, but it was picked up crossing Panama by the people coming out west. If you go through the cemetery and you see a grave marker with a lamb, you know there's a child buried there. And this gives you a little insight into how short the lives of many children were. Measles, of course, was around and measles had made the headlines the last couple of years uh, due to the anti-vaxxers and the lack of kids getting immunized against measles. A very miserable disease and it occasionally can be fatal. <coughs> Excuse me. Now this is smallpox. Smallpox was totally eradicated from the world in 1979. The first successful vaccine was the smallpox vaccine way back in 1796 when Jenner used cowpox to immunize. Uh, now we have smallpox vaccine, fortunately, because it's disappeared from the world, it's not used anymore, but it did not use smallpox uh, as the agent for immunization. During the 1770s, smallpox killed at least 30% of the West Coast Native Americans. And 16th century Aztec drawings, you'll see, of victims of smallpox and measles. So we know it goes way, way back. <clears throat> Diphtheria, another Bad killer of children killed in two ways. It formed either a toxin that would kill the child or it formed a membrane over the trachea so the child could not breathe and would suffocate. So here we have Mulford's antitoxin, which would be injected when the toxin was killing the child. And if it was the membrane preventing their breathing, Dr. O'Dwyer developed larynx tubes so you could go down in the throat and perforate the membrane and put a little breathing tube in. <clears throat> well, I think you all are familiar with this, the 1918 flu epidemic. It's estimated the number of deaths from that epidemic worldwide were 50 million with about 675,000 deaths in the United States. And of course, the death toll was very high because it was during the World War and soldiers were packed together in ships and in barracks. Another 
common disease in the 1800s and still not uncommon today was consumption, which we know better as tuberculosis. Again, there were many pad medicines from marshmallow cream to Scotch emulsion <coughs> to Norwegian liver, cod liver oil that were allegedly helpful, but not really for consumption. <clears throat> there were two TB sanatoriums in our area in the 1900s, one in Weimar and one in Colfax, not that far from Sacramento. This image is for a pneumothorax apparatus that would be used to introduce air in the chest cavity to collapse a lung. And by collapsing a lung, it was felt that you could rest that lung and it may recover after a period of time from tuberculosis. Well, we, when we say the big four, we think of the big four that developed the railroad, but the big four in medicine were bleeding, cupping, also known as blistering, puking, and purging. Now here's a letter I read at the beginning, but I bring it back because it shows that patient was subjected to bleeding and puking and blistering. <coughs> now bleeding comes from Hippocrates theories of four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And if these were not in balance in the body, they would cause disease. So what would you do if there were too much blood causing disease, you'd bleed. This is a flame, which would be used to cut into a vein for bleeding. This might be considered a Swiss army flame or maybe even a veterinary flame because bleeding was actually used in animals and horses also. <clears throat> this is a bleeding bowl that would collect the blood, uh, particularly when the vein in the fold of the arm was incised. This is a scarificator with eight blades that were spring operated to make eight incisions for bleeding. This is a much more beautiful scarificator, but it did the same thing. It had 12 blades in it and basically operated the same way. You'd put tension in the spring, put it in the skin, push the button, and the 12 blades would make incisions and allow bleeding. This is an image from an English piece of art and it shows the blood gushing out from the vein and the fold of the arm into a bowl. This is basically like a flame that we showed, uh, but it's spring operated. So if one did not have the guts to push through, you just put this on the skin, push the button and it would incise the vein. <clears throat> the Berber pole, a reminder of the Berber surgeons, and of course, leeches. Leeches are still used today with a plastic surgeon. And we can tell you why during the question and answer. We have cupping that was used. Cupping has become popular again. The uh, eff effectiveness of it is questionable. Puking uh, was caused by medication to produce vomiting, heaving, hurling, etc. Purging, a uh, purgative or a laxative was used. And these were to rid the body of things that they thought were causing the disease. Arsenic, strychnine, mercury, narcotics were very common medicines of the time. As you can see, and this was probably early 1900s, contained arsenic and strychnine. These all contained morphine. On the trail, uh, Red pepper was sometimes used as treatment as was a mustard plaster. This is an example of the pill containers that the doctors would carry in house calls. Dr. Morrison Stillman actually had a hospital at 3rd and K in 1849. We had Pohemus, one of the prior uh, very prominent pharmacies of the time. And we have Dr. Fay in his office he had the first extra machine in California in 1898. And this is a picture of the generator to produce the electricity for the machine. Now our museum is generally open to the community uh, from nine to four, but because of the pandemic, it's been closed. And unfortunately we do not have a date when it will be open, 
but if you go to our website, simply ssvms.org, <coughs> uh, you basically can look at a lot of virtual things, including a half hour video tour that I have put on the website. And also there is a virtual tour of the physicians buried at the city cemetery. Okay, now we've got to our question time. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I don't know about you all, but some of those devices were like giving me the heebie-jeebies. I was like, oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> Um, I um, I do have a couple of questions that I received via email. Um, so a question that someone has is, was it common knowledge that there would be so much illness and disease when folks were traveling to California? Like, I know that people were probably like aspiring to like, you know, strike gold and make it rich, but did they know like the consequences of all those um, illnesses and disease? Well, because nobody had done it by wagon before, I think uh, people were not fully prepared for it. They suspected there might be, but I don't think they had any idea of how immense that problem would be. Mm -hmm. How common are some of the diseases that you mentioned that were really prevalent back then? Like, are those diseases like still really common now? I know you mentioned tuberculosis, but um, yeah. Uh, tuberculosis is still quite common. And in fact, some of it is resistant to a lot of the drugs we now have that normally will cure it. Uh, a lot of the other diseases like yellow fever, malaria and all are still prominent in other parts of the world. <coughs> the only disease I mentioned, I think, that we do not see anymore is smallpox. Fortunately, most of those are not present in the U.S., but if you travel to other countries, uh, you'll run into quite a few of them. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. Bob, for that very informative presentation. I know I learned a lot and I am honestly very thankful for the way that medicine has evolved. Um, but yes, a big thank you as well to our audience for always supporting our programming. Um, like I said before, if you want to keep supporting programming like this, um, keep in mind the date of May 6th, which is the big day of giving you can donate directly on our website or go to the Big Day of Giving website and find our profile. And as always, follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, you name it. You can join our listserv so you can stay up to date with what is happening, especially as things are kind of opening up again. Um, thank you all once again, and we hope you will join us at our next one. <laughs>